everyone, this is Atuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology, and today I'm going to be visiting with one of my friends and colleagues, a former student in one of my programs, Alex Amorosi, who's also a yogi, uh, really like Alex a lot. He's going to be talking to us about the path of professional astrology today, uh, giving some tips, sharing his story. Uh, you guys know I like to bring people on to do that once in a while, so that's our agenda for today. Don't forget, before we get into it, to like and subscribe, share your comments in the comments section, click the notification bell for updates if you want to know when I'm going live. You can always find a transcript of my daily talks on my website, nightlightastrology.com. If you're there and you're taking a look at the courses or the readings that I offer and you have any questions, feel free to email info at nightlightastrology.com. All right. Well, Alex, I'm super excited to have you here today. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me, man. This is a joy. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. I mean, um, I what year did you come through the, the program? uh 2019 into 2020 yeah, yeah yeah because i mean i think i think i remember spending a little bit of the pandemic era with you i feel like yeah. in the outset yeah i remember us all kind of huddled around the screen <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah totally oh my gosh well um yeah i wanted to have you on because i think you what you're doing um, you know, with astrology, you've been a healing practitioner, a yoga teacher in other modalities for a long time. Um, and we definitely share the path of yoga in common. You've added astrological consulting and counseling to your repertoire. Um, you've been a student of astrology for a while. You came through my program and it was really great to have you there because, you know, whenever fellow yoga teachers are coming through, it's just, it's nice to be able to help a fellow yogi, like c continue cultivating their astrology skills. So yeah, but for all those reasons, I wanted to have you come in and talk a little bit about your journey with astrology. I usually start by asking people like, how did all of this happen for you? When did you first get into astrology? In your case, maybe tell us a little bit about all the things that you do and how all of it started because there's, there's, there's a, a bunch in your toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I started actually studying. Oh my God. I, I'm, I'm rewinding farther and farther in my life now to get back to there. Um, so I probably started, I started studying Buddhism, then Buddhism when I was about 20 and um, into, I was a classical musician and that's a pretty high strung career path when you're going into it. There's a lot of stress and a lot of hours in it. And uh, Zen was the first time where I had a sort of formal teacher spiritually even though I didn't have a sort of spiritual background to my life. And then um, I got into yoga when I was about 24. I had hurt my knee in one of those sort of undiagnosable, there's just pain in my knee type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. No one could kind of figure out what was going on. So I started doing yoga and the pain went away in about six months. And my, uh, uh, my back started feeling better. And I was in a, one of those places in my life where, where um, I had lost direction and I was, too young to really put that into words at that point in my life. But I just knew I needed something that would not only be physically good for me, but something that I could, um, I could keep enhancing and working with the spiritual practices, which was odd for me because I didn't have a very, I didn't have any spiritual background growing up, um, really. And it was something that just kept coming to me as something I need to do. You know, like one of those things that kind of just keeps sticking in your brain, like you should do this more. Um, and I loved yoga so much. I did a teacher training program the year after that was 2004. And I started teaching in 2005 and then started teaching full time in 2006. And um, I loved it. It was not, uh, you know, looking back, it was one of those things where I was just like, I'll just jump in and teach yoga full time. And I didn't realize like that, that, that takes some hustle. Um, <laughs> I wasn't quite used to that. I was like, oh, wow, I'm going to teach a lot of classes to make this work. Um, but then I started training teachers in 2007 and, you know, kind of in modules and teacher trainings and then started doing more teacher training uh, as I got into 2011, 2012. Actually, no earlier than that. It's hard to even go back and think about it. But um, I had done like spirituality, I think in a way that I don't know if you found this too, but like, I think when I was first starting out with yoga and spirituality, it was very externally focused. And I was looking for something that would kind of help me escape from in here rather than go deeper in here, even though I would have said I was doing the opposite. So then I hit my Saturn return and everything. <laughs> <happened>. <laughs> and it got, <laughs> yeah. 
It's a, it's a hefty Saturn return too. I have my Saturn's at the tail end of Virgo, so uh, and my Moon's at the beginning of Libra. So I got a Saturn return, and then a Saturn conjunct my Moon. Plus, I had Uranus opposing my Moon and Pluto squaring my Moon. Oh my God! So, yeah, yeah, it was a <clears throat> dynamic time in my life, and uh, <laughs> I remember I went to an astrologer actually up here in Massachusetts, and um she looked back at that time with me she looked at the chart and you know how when you see transits in a chart and you go oh <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> well this is that was certainly a powerful time for you, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah so but that was actually where um so many a confluence of so many things kind of blew apart in my life that it started to show me where I was deceiving myself in my own spiritual practice, where I was lying to myself, where I was uh, treating myself still with disrespect, but saying I wasn't using sort of spiritual mm -hmm. language. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I had like two relationships blow apart within the, the course of a year and really kind of dramatically so. And so um, the, how I, this le led me to astrology, I was, I was lying on the beach, this horse neck beach on the south coast here in Massachusetts. And um, I was just lost. It was the first time I could actually like say, I don't know what to do. I have no, no tools in my toolbox of, to know what to do here other than to say, I don't know what to do. Hmm. And I looked up at the sky and I still at that point didn't really have a really theistic understanding of my spirituality, but I just said spontaneously, God, I see what I'm doing and I don't know how to stop. Please. Hmm send me whatever I need to help stop causing myself and other people so much suffering. And um, the, I didn't, I really didn't know how to stop. I could see it all happening, but I, it was like compulsive. I, I knew I was going to continue in these patterns unless I got something to intervene with it. And uh, I didn't realize when you make a prayer like that, uh, the universe takes you at your word oh, and yeah. got thrown in the deep end. Uh, of my shadow for a while. I had a lot of Pluto going on for a long time. So I was in the underworld for a long time. Uh, and astrology came about sort of at the tail end of that experience. I had gone through all sorts of shamanic and, and, and energy work practices that were really helpful. I found a great spiritually based therapist who was super helpful and a great teacher of mine. But astrology was kind of like my last holdout where I was like, that can't really, no, you know, I have a lot of Virgo in my chart. I have a very, very strong Mercury in my chart. Like, no, that, no, 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 <laughs> no, that doesn't work. No, no. But um, I began to realize as I stopped putting down my dismissiveness, you know, um, and I, I try to be open, you know, Sagittarius, try to be very curious and open. I'm, I want to learn about everything in the world. It was, astrology was describing something I had seen my entire, and felt my entire life. It, it was a language where like, it was almost like, like a, a veil had been removed from my eyes. And I'm like, Oh, I've seen this my entire life. This language of astrology is describing the interactions of energy that I've been aware of forever. Hmm. Right. Um, and it was just this beautiful formal language. And then I, I think I may have said this to you in a reading I had with you. I was like, it just took me over. It felt like mm -hmm. it, it really just could, came in and was like, now you're obsessed with astro astrology. And I went, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is and how it happens. Yeah. I got there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I feel I, I sometimes, you know, I, and I think I heard someone else say this originally, but it's like, you're getting bit by the bug, the astrology bug. Yeah. And, um, it goes viral in your circuitry somehow and you, you start seeing the world through the archetypes and the language and the transits and you get really obsessed with your birth chart for a while that, you know, for most people, like the more you start getting into astrology as a student, eventually, you know, your obsession with your own birth chart sort of chills out a little bit. It's always still useful and helpful, but it like starts calm down. And then it seems like at some point, you start realizing like, I know way more about this than most people. And I might actually be able to read people's charts. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like, <laughs> so then I guess you do. Was there a moment for you where you started realizing, I mean, you were still teaching yoga when I met you and are you, and are you still? Yeah, I still teach a couple of public classes. Um, I was teaching a lot more when I was, when we first met. Yeah. Um, You're but, offering readings now, right? Yeah, I'm offering readings. And as part of the, the, the sort of spiritually based coaching and energetic energetically based coaching that I do, um, the chart's an invaluable tool. 
mm-hmm. to have when you're doing that work. And it's just, you know, and my clients really enjoy it because there's something concrete about the chart. You can actually show something rather than, you know, when you're doing a lot of energetic work, you're, you're describing something that's very intangible. Um, and so, yeah, I, I started doing readings. I think the, uh, not long after I came out of your class, not long after that. And, and that was interesting too, because <laughs> I'm, I'm always so impressed with like, when I listen to like you give a talk or like, you know, Nadia Shah or Rick Levine, you know, these really amazing astrologers, because when I first started, I was like, I couldn't get any words out around it. I'm like, yeah, Saturn makes things small and Jupiter makes them big. And you know, it was, it's <laughs> and Venus is love and Mercury thinks, you know, <laughs> it was just right. hard to like, but I, it was very much like when I talked to, you know, I'm training yoga teachers, I always tell them, I'm like, just keep speaking it. You have to like get the language out. And mm-hmm. then I began to realize I'm like, oh, the more I practice this, the more I'm beginning to figure out my own way of articulating that. And it just started to get easier. The more readings I did, it just took practice. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that we don't talk about this, that our astrologers don't talk about this that often. But when you say I'm reading charts for people, you might you might as well, at least in the beginning for a good while, you might as well say I'm learning to read charts for people because you don't develop as a reader unless you I mean, it's like reading books when you're like my daughter's, uh, you know, going into first grade and she's practicing reading her books every night. And I've watched her not know the word they, and now she does. And now every time she sees it, she recognizes it and she she understands the why at the end. And so I feel like it's very similar with astrology. And like you said, with yoga teacher trainings, which um, my wife was much more the leader of in our studio for a while, but it's the same thing. It's like, you, you don't, you can't, think to yourself, I won't be an astrologer, I won't be an astrologer or a yoga teacher until I know how to perfectly talk astrology or yoga. It's actually that you learn to read by reading, you learn to teach by teaching. And um, so you have to, uh, you have to just be confident in knowing that if you just keep talking astrology and talking charts, the language comes in time. And that's really just such a great point you made. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something I learned from your class too, which I really appreciated was the live readings that you do. And to see that, um, what I, what I, what I took from that one thing was when watching you do that was by doing so many readings over so many years, you had also developed your own lexicon of how to speak about Venus in the ninth house or Saturn square, the sun or something like that, where, it came from the experience of seeing people in practice and seeing how it was manifesting in their life. And then you start to put it together. Like one of my Reiki teachers, a good friend of mine up here, she, um, she calls it your healing glossary. When you're doing energy work, you just get a sensation that means this or something that means this. And you, that just takes experience of putting that Mm -hmm. together. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. And that, that, that just that language acquisition can be so, overwhelming for people and even in the classes when you're getting you're hitting and hit by so much theory and and i'm thinking now about you know the the way in which i studied as well and it's that it's that process of just falling into the deep end and um figuring out that if you just stay there long enough you don't drown you actually learn to swim and it's an incredible thing about you know an immersion in any kind of language i mean I remember being in Peru for a a good long while and I knew no Spanish and suddenly I had like a little bit of working Spanish just by being there and living there for like a month or whatever. So I I think that's just kind of something about language itself. But the thing is, it's really amazing about astrology is that the language is also divinatory. So there's this weird way in which the language act, it happens in reading charts and studying books and so forth. But it's also just like, oh, Mars is square Pluto. My daughter after her sparkler on 4th of July, we just gave him some sparklers and stuff. Her sparkler ran out and she thought it's done. So she grabbed it and it's still hot, right? She she burned her finger. And I immediately thought, well, Mars is square to Pluto. There's a, she burned, she burned something, something that was like a firework. And um, it's like suddenly the language acquisition process is just seeping through your experiences too, which is, you know, And then it works with whatever modality you have, like energy healing or yoga or whatever else. 
Right, exactly. And I, I found it so, um, it's so helpful too when you can just make that connection, right? Where you can just say like, oh, Saturn is square of the sun or Venus. It, it, it also helps to, um, it depersonalizes it a little bit. It makes it like a, this is something that's just happening in the ether right now. And like you said, it's almost like the archetype starts to speak to you. It starts to come into your into your psyche and gives you through your own nervous system and your own life experiences the way to see it and describe it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you in the way that you're if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that what are often very intangible energetic levels of experience within the energy healing paradigm that you work in become a little bit easier to understand because you can also look to the chart to understand what someone or or where or how someone might be experiencing something yeah that's exactly it exactly and it, it helps them too you know i actually thought um because i brought my own biases from my own sort of like rational virgo stellium you know of like well people don't want to see their astrology chart blah blah, blah. Everybody wants to see their astrology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, people, and, and, and clients really like to see it because, you know, I can give them a little bit of sense of timing. I can show here's Mars, here's Venus, here's here are tangible things and their relationship to each other that you're exactly, it's exactly that. It takes that intangible level of, you know, that loca of space where it's a little bit more uh, abstract and makes it feel a little bit more real. And I've actually found really comforting for people, even when it's a tough transit, there's something comforting about seeing, oh, here's how this is playing out. These are the interactions of the archetypes that lasts about this long, that sort of idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It is comforting. It's oddly comforting in t when things are heavy, like um, my daughter is not at the age where she can appreciate, you know, Mars square Pluto when her finger is burning, right? And and like, you know, there's lots of examples like that where we may not be able to appreciate in the moment because it's so intense, but as the healing or reflecting upon experience takes place and we are able to make meaning out of something, that's often when it comes in as well. If not, sometimes actually in the moment too, which can be pretty amazing. Yeah, um, yeah uh, it's like, um, What's that, you know, that meme where it shows person with like all the numbers in the air, crunching, calculating, and, you know, to a certain extent, it's like astrologers are walking around the world having experiences while also sort of doing that at times, but <laughs> <It's so true. laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So I want to go back in time a little bit and you went from like, okay, I've got an injury or I'm, I'm getting into, by the way, I feel like Zen is really like such an interest at like, to, to me, it makes total sense that Zen would be paired with classical music. Yeah. Like I feel like of, of the there, to me, they're all sort of, you know, I, I'm a sort of perennialist. So I look at like the similarities between all these different traditions and I'm sort of like, they all are sort of taking us in the same direction. Zen Buddhism though, if I had to describe it aesthetically would to me be a little bit like, you know, the classical music of your, of your meditative options. You know what I mean? Like, so, um, I, and, and maybe that's not right. Cause someone else might experience like jazz. I don't know. But anyway, I think that's really appropriate. But the question that I had was like, how did you get, how did energy healing come up from like Zen and classical music to energy healing seems like a real shift to me. Like, and you mentioned a couple of relationships that were like bonkers or whatever, but like, well, how did that shift take place? Oh my God. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to connect the dots back in my own mind. Um, Zen was the simplicity of Zen was really helpful for me. Um, as someone who can get really lost in the weeds of Saturn and Virgo, right. You know, every, everything has to be analyzed to the nth degree. And Zen is very much about like, no, you just kind of sit with your experience. You just experience the world as it is. Um, but I think the most powerful thing about that experience that led me towards energy healing was, and I didn't realize it at the time, my teacher, who I can't even remember his last name, his first name was Mark. One of those, I don't know if you've had these types of teachers in your experience where they are so attentive, it's like they can look right through you. And I remember, I'll never forget when he first looked at me, it felt like I had to like cover up. Mm -hmm. He was like he was looking and seeing all of my shit, right? Everything that I didn't want anybody to see, he was somehow seeing and compassionate, just paying attention to me. And I think if I look back, that was the moment where 
that level of attention, that level of paying attention started to break open something within me that took many, many years to come to fruition. And so I, um, I realized at that moment, somehow that stuff was being released and that difficult dark shadow stuff, but I didn't have the capacity yet to hold it. So when I got what to 2012, that summer of 2012, and that's when I, I really, you know, I was going through the thick of those difficult transits looking back. Um, I had avoided that stuff by being in a relationship and making it all about that other person. I will be the best Saturn and Virgo boyfriend you have ever had. I will be, but, but that way I don't have to see any of this. Hmm. And when I was on the beach that summer and I had that experience, probably my, my first sort of transcendental experience where I really was like broken open out mm -hmm. of no choice. You know, Saturn kind of puts you in that box where you have no choice. Somehow the combination of that experience with Mark when I was taking his class, going through to that part of the, that, the beach that summer, which was about 10 years later, began to open me to a subtler realm that I had always kind of been aware of, but now had become really started to notice, like there's something else that's there that's guiding me. There's something mm -hmm. else that's present. And I want to know what that is. I got super curious about it. Um, and that's when I did Reiki and I did some shamanic energy work. And um, I did that in addition to doing therapy, which I found the two of them really helpful because I needed that rational understanding from a therapist. Yeah. And I also needed like, the, the understanding of what I what I had been perceiving, I had in my whole life been very aware of people on an empathic level, somewhat in I don't like the word psychic because I think so much comes along with that, but like aware of the subtler realms, but I didn't have language for it. And somehow those two experiences 10 years apart began to break me open to realize what I call the subtle universe, that there's a there's a level of understanding. I don't know if it was something similar with you with ayahuasca in a different way um, or it's similar. So. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, I began to realize that when people work, when I worked with the energetic realm of my own being, it was helping me to heal things I thought had already been intractable because it was pretty good to the root of what was there. But it also helped me realize how much we're picking up from the field around us all the time and how much information I had been aware of. In my chart, you know, in astrology speak, I have a Sun and Neptune conjunction in my chart. So I'm very kind of porous to all of this information. And when I figured out how to work with that and how to integrate it, it was the most life-changing experience I have ever had. It, it took me from feeling super neurotic all the time to this sense of feeling really, really grounded and stable within myself for the first time. You know, it took me 35 years to get there. I was about 35. And I wanted to help other people do that. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I was it kind does. of, yeah. yeah, it does. It's interesting. It's, uh, I think you know one of the things that I was that I was thinking about as you were sharing your story is how how many times we try because people have not been really present for us often starting with our parents I think that's a big thing as a parent myself I realized that it's not the big f ups it's really not because humans make mistakes if I had to say anything that is the biggest challenge of parenting and like the, the worst thing I could do to my kids, it would be to not like, it's not just listening, it's attentiveness. Yeah. It's like being present with them yeah. so that all of whatever, you know, whatever time I have with them, cause it's not all, you know, they have their own space too, but when I'm there with them and I just simply bear witness to who they are and all of their experiences and they see me bearing witness, like present and compassionate and loving, but just attentive, that's probably the number one gift I could give my kids. Exactly. And I look at my life and I look at, you know, I think my, I think I was very blessed that I, I think I had some quality attention from my parents. And I think, you know, hopefully a lot of people listening had at least some, you know, but if you, and I think here's one of the things that I think results, and I see this in myself and clients, you know, even in my kids is that when you don't feel like people are really paying attention to you, I think 
there's a way in which you start trying to create a personality or different categories or costumes of personality that will draw people's attention. Exactly. And, and they don't have to be exotic. Like maybe they are, maybe you, uh, you know, uh, maybe you go remember my kids in my, in my high school, like going Gothic, you know, like dark paint or, um, uh, mascara or whatever. I mean, and I'm not, and I have no judgments toward that whatsoever, but my point is, is that I look at my life and all the different times in which I tried to like, let me be something to get some kind of attention and how much that goes back to probably places in my life or areas where there wasn't, there weren't a lot of teachers or people who just really were present for me. Um, not to, again, not to get into like blaming my parents or I'm, I really feel like I've, I'm in a pretty good space with all that now, but, um, and then, I, and then, you know, and you think about um, so much of what yoga is and by extension what astrology is when we're looking at our charts and so on and so forth is we're trying to celebrate and discover all that we really are and being present to all the different facets of who we are. Um, and the fact is that the chart is like, I mean, a parent isn't right the, quite the right word, but it's a witness. The sky exactly. somehow witnesses us and is like, hey, I see all of these things. And I think that's why people are like, when you said earlier that people are like, everyone wants to see their chart. I think it comes from that, you know? And and I think, you know, there's, you go to a yoga studio and just as someone who has been in that world and you have too, you'll hear yoga teachers saying, you're not your body or your emotions or you're not your thoughts or you're like, let them flow through you, be present, witness them, et cetera. But that's only really one part of the story, isn't it? Because as in energy work, or I think in shamanic work or in an astrological chart reading, it's not about trying to say, oh, you know, like dissociate from any categories of identity as much as it is to create a space within which you can relate to and develop intimacy with the different parts of yourself. It's hard if you're always trying to, um, be so intensely identified with different uh, categories of personality that there's no space in between you and those categories to relate with. And what I was struck by when you were describing the energy healing and the birth chart is like, plus yoga is that that's sort of what you're able to do. You're able to say, here's, let's get some space so you can yeah. see, but also celebrate and be witness to who you are. It, it's there's so, I have so many thoughts that's so beautiful. And I think so true. And I think that, um, what in in 2012, the great blessing of a Pluto transit is it gets you to start to integrate your shadow and it gets in to see the shadow and to witness the shadow, which really wants to be seen, which really wants to have witness born to. It. I always think of, you know, I've heard Oprah say over and over again how anybody who ever sat on her stage only ever wanted to be seen. They only ever wanted to be noticed. And I think that the chart does that. I think that an energetic understanding of yourself does because it it takes you back to a more abstract level where you can look in on what's going on and you don't become like for me i have so much virgo in my chart i was so obsessed with being good and pure and right and doing things right mm -hmm. that i had no room for the spontaneity and the power and something that comes from different other aspects of my chart and my understanding of myself. And one of the things that, is, that was coming to me too is, you know, in, in terms of being a gay man and working with other gay men and other queer clients, I have seen nothing more healing than to show them their chart. Because you grow up when, you, when you're LGBTQ, when you're a queer person, you grow up feeling in this culture, you're the wrong one. You're the bad one. You're the outside of the norm one. You're the, the, the Aquarius Saturn sort of, you know, you're sitting on the outside sort of thing. And I always tell them like, this, this is the witness of your perfection right here in this lifetime. This is mm -hmm. looking and there is nothing wrong with you. This is how this, this chart is expressing within your unique life. And, you know, even like when you, when you go outside at night, you know, I was thinking about last winter when um, Venus was setting up for a retrograde and you, I, out, right outside of my house, there was Venus and Saturn and Jupiter sitting like up in a line for like a month above my house. And I thought, this is so perfect and beautiful. 
And I would never go outside and be like, hey, Saturn, move over to the left a little bit. Or, hey, Jupiter, you know, what? <laughs> you know drop over to the right a little bit because like you're a little close. Like you would never do. You just go and say, this is perfect. And I'm like, we're a part of that. That's, yeah. a, that's showing us that we are all a part of that. And whatever it is, whether, you know, for me, it happens to be with a lot of queer clients, but I think all of us in some way want to remember or have that deep knowing within us that we're a part of this system yeah. in which we live. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I feel like when you were talking about how at first the spirituality that you were embracing was kind of opposite everything you were saying or thinking that it was. Exactly. And it, it just goes back to the same idea, which is that, you know, we just we want to be seen and loved so deeply. And I think it's the same thing. Like I I reflect um you know, I, I reflect often on uh, on this through the different, you know, like my I, like club ayahuasca for 10 years. You know, it was like got the tattoo right on my wrist like I'm an ayahuasca guy, you know, and um, and I look back at at this as the tattoo is like, you know, fading. And, you know, it's like the further I get from it, the more I, I, I realize like um in an experience that made me feel really seen and really um, understood by some presence, some plant intelligence, you know, something bigger than myself, that my first inclination was still sort of a trauma response of let me tattoo this now on me and be like, that's who I am. This is what I am now see me. And, and um, it, it feels like the journey of spirituality with astrology and the thing that the reason I say that we, we obsess over our charts and then we let go of it in some, in some ways is the same. It's like, here's the tattoo of who you are. And then as you get to know your chart over time, it's like the tattoo fades that it, and it, it becomes this really remarkable part of you. And it's still there. Like the birth chart is always this really beautiful piece of who you are, but your relationship, you know, you're not like getting the, uh, the um you know like the virgo tattoo or whatever it is you know you're you're like letting it relax a little bit and it's that relaxation of all of these categories of identity that allow us to actually like inhabit them it's like exactly. do you know what i mean and i i just feel like that um that gift that you were talking about with you know working let's say you're working with a young gay man who maybe is on the brink of coming out or something and it's like astrology is at least, you know, maybe in the moment, but in five or 10 years down the road, if the person keeps astrology in their lives, it, it allows them to inhabit exactly who they are. And also, I think more than just validate, it allows you to feel comfortable in who you are over time. Exactly. It, that's exactly it. And that, at least that's how I've, I've experienced it. And I, I've seen that with some clients is it, you really begin to realize, you know, it's, I think we often think that the universe is out there. The, you know, there's the universe and we look at it through the Hubble, right? And that's how we know there, there's a universe. We don't realize like it's everywhere. We're a part <laughs> of that here right now. It's, it's, and that, you know, as, as you say and so beautifully all the time, you know, the, the planets are bearing witness to you. They, they are seeing you. And there is, there is nothing wrong with any of the identities. In fact, what I found was the identities start to go haywire or cause uh, challenges when they're not witnessed. Yeah. When yeah. They're not, when they're not allowed to express in some way. That was definitely true with the, you know, the Saturn Pluto ish darker elements in my chart for me. That's, that's what I really began to explore in 2012. That's, it reminds me of a story. I'll tell this story because I think you'll find this interesting. So I've, I'm going through Saturn in Aquarius opposing my ascendant ruler, Venus in Leo. And um, I had this, first of all, I, with the gas prices and everything, I thought I'd, I'd like to, I want to make a switch over to something more environmentally friendly. And like, I started looking at hybrids or electric vehicles and stuff like that. And I found out my, I had been last time that we got cars and stuff like that. We did the car shopping. I, I did the, I got like a family responsible vehicle and I really had wanted a Jeep Wrangler because I had a Jeep Wrangler when I was younger. And it's like, you know, it feeds into my whole ego or whatever. So I'm like, all right, like I can't get a Wrangler. It's not responsible. It's terrible, uh, you know, mileage and eco, not eco-friendly or whatever. Well, they made, they made a hybrid, right? And it actually has enough um, 
you know, it gets enough uh, miles on the charge where I'll probably fill it like a couple times a year at most. Like, so, cause I don't, cause I work from home. I don't travel much. So I'm like, Oh my God, I'm actually, I could, I could get a Wrangler again. Wow. That would be really incredible. Passed it by the wife. She was like, okay. So I was like, wow, this is going to happen. Well, my dad growing up had a Wrangler and he had a, a, a white Wrangler. It was a white Jeep Wrangler and he got it right around 40 right? Which is where I am right now. And it's sort of in my memory marked the beginning of like a pretty intense downward spiral and like midlife crisis that he had. So I had a lot of trepidation around doing this around 40. And I was like, Oh, like, I don't know, I don't want to repeat some pattern or I don't, you know, I don't want to be like in, indulgent, because it felt kind of like an indulgent thing. And I was really tripped out about it. And I was talking to my Jungian therapist, like, you know, some somewhat regularly about this, which is sounds so stupid when I say it out loud. But so anyway, I decided to get a black one and I got it and I was, you know, uh, I was, you know, elated. I was honestly really happy to be in. So like, this is my old car. Like this is the only car I've ever really loved in my life. And I feel like I have a Wrangler again. It makes me really happy. So I was being geeky about it. And I, I went and my wife jokingly before we were going to bed said, you know, you got to give it a name. And I was like, nope, I don't do that because that's that's weird. And I've always just fe felt like that was really corny when people name their vehicles. And I'm just not the type. If I had a boat, I know you're supposed to do it with like a boat, but I'll never have a boat. So, okay. Like maybe I'll have like a kayak or a canoe or something, but so I'm like, okay, well, um, I go, maybe something will come up in a dream and it'll give me a name. So I, I ended up having this dream and in the dream I was, uh, in the empire strikes back and um, I'm in the scene where Luke Skywalker is realizing that his father is Darth Vader. Oh, so, wow. yeah. So, and, but in this, I'm realizing not that my father is Darth Vader, but that I'm Darth Vader because I got a black Jeep and yeah. not a white Jeep. My dad had had the white Jeep and it was this really, and, and when I realized that just like in the movie, you know, with Luke Skywalker, go, no, like, it's just like, and I actually, I actually woke up from <laughs> <laughs> like I actually woke up laughing because it was so absurd and like funny or whatever. Yeah. But then I started thinking about it and like, why am I having such an intensely hard time? Uh, like I'm not someone um, who, you know, makes splashy purchases of things that I selfishly want. I don't, I'm not, a, and you know, everything about yoga is really not about materialism. And, you know, so I felt I actually was really, really struggling with this more. I mean, more so than I'm even describing right now. And um, then, you know, so at any rate, what I thought was really fascinating was after this dream, I popped onto Instagram and I said to everyone, you know, what would, if you were an astrologer, what would you name your black Jeep Wrangler? And I, it was just a joke. And I put a picture of it up and whatever. And I'm kid you not people who they couldn't see each other responding until I reposted what they responded. And I got probably 40 or 50 responses and like 10 of them were Darth Vader. <laughs> like I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. Or daddy Vader. That was a pretty funny one. <laughs> <laughs> But I, so, so sorry, I'll, I'll, this story is almost over. So, um, so anyway, um, what I thought was really interesting, I was telling, again, talking to my uh, Jungian therapist about all of this, and I love unpacking dreams with him. And I told him about all of this. And he said, you know, what's really interesting is, um, you know, this is a part of you, the, the, the Wrangler part of you, the person who likes to drive a Wrangler and the part of you that is worried about becoming like your father, who was a Methodist minister who sort of, you know, fell down, lost his faith for a time, et cetera. And you're worried about this being this like materialistic shadow that's going to come up and like take over. It's, it's all very much like the, the, the connection between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. And that this is a, whatever, you know, what he said, but you know, what's really interesting is like what happens to Luke throughout the story. Uh, he starts off in the first in star Wars in white, right? Empire Strikes Back, he's in gray. And yeah. by Return of the Jedi, he's in black. And and he's got the black robe yeah. on, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I never thought of this. Yeah, and um, along the way, when he's realizing that his father is Darth Vader, he's just gotten his hand chopped off. And like his father, he starts to have a part machine yeah. on his body. And he he just, you know, was saying like, there's, there's something about incorporating all parts of ourselves, the dark, the shadow, everything that's, you know, it's even a part of his story in Star Wars. And it was the simplest explanation to me 
ever um, that and, and it made so helped me make so much sense of Saturn currently opposing Venus, getting this black, uh, yeah. s- perhaps materialistic thing. And but it's the shadow that needs to be incorporated. Um, obviously, we can go to extremes. We can get destructive, and we can we can fall into the illusion of materialism. And I think we have to be vigilant about that. But what I hear you saying, and that that long story, this long winded way of saying that. Isn't that exactly what astrology is helping us do ultimately with all of these different parts of ourself is like, actually, the the cosmos is this perfectly arranged collection of things. And astrology is somehow just helping us bring that picture back into our understanding of ourselves. A thousand percent. You know, it's what, what comes up for me, too, in that I'd never thought of that, that white, gray, black, that now I'll never unsee that. That's amazing. Um I know, right? I hadn't thought of it either. He totally blew my mind with that. I mean, and I'm not, I'm not a Star Wars. I'm a serious Star Wars geek. Like I've yeah. read the, like that whole thing, like it, it, the whole thing. Um, but I also was thinking too about how you know I've taught from this before, and I've done talks. Is you know, at the end of Return of the Jedi, Luke draws on his anger. He draws on his shadow side to defeat or bring down Darth Vader, but he may, he has it under control. He's able to see it, witness it. He sees the hand and then throws, you know, the lightsaber, you know, you'll never make me a Sith or, you know, I'm always, I'm a Jedi or something like that. But I always think that that's interesting because we work so hard you know, and from this story that I'm hearing from you and, and maybe in a different way, my experience in 2012, and I'm still working with this in a lot of ways, is this, we work so hard at saying my shadow is bad, my darkness is bad. Well, I when I go outside at night and see Saturn and Jupiter in the sky, I don't look up at Saturn and say Saturn is bad and Jupiter is good. I'm like, they're both beautiful. Right. They're both beautiful. And they're both necessary, you know, to, to it's it's the sense of being able to step back And as I would see it at the end of Return of the Jedi, that's what Luke's able to do. He's able to have a pause of reflection, a a mindfulness moment almost of saying like, oh, if I keep going, then I do become this. But I'm actually incorporate, he incorporates it and then he can throw it away and say, I can draw on this. I'm aware of it. It's integrated with me, but I don't have to let it run me. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's what was happening for me. Um, in, in you know my experience, and I'm still working with this in a lot of ways, is when you realize exa- exactly what you said, it's it's all a part of us. The cosmos is representing a whole, a whole. And all of it can be witnessed and seen, and all of it has its place. You know, Mars has its place, Pluto has its place, the planets we call malefic or you know, can be difficult, but they have their place. I'm grateful eternally for my moon getting blown apart by by Uranus and Pluto over the course of two years. I mean, it was tough. It was really tough, but it woke my ass up. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. It it made me, um, you know, Saturn in there in the mix too. It boxed me so f- into, it boxed me in so that I had to ask for help and I had to, I had to look at what I had been trying to avoid for so long. Yeah. 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 yeah it's funny. Um, I forgot to mention this part of the story. It fits in perfectly what you were saying. So I, I, through all of this, um, I kept thinking, you know, I was reflecting a lot on my birth chart and the Saturn Venus transit. And so the name that came to me and I'm not, I can, I cannot, um, I don't know if I'll ever be able to actually refer to my Jeep with a name, but if it had a name, it would be dark star. Nice. Yeah. Just nice. perfectly like, and I think about, you know, like I was born in a nighttime chart, uh, chart, um, sect light is the moon in Capricorn, a Saturn ruled sign full, full yeah. moon, you know? So I was, I'm a child of a dark star. I'm a child of Saturn in a way. You got to find room for that. You got to exactly like you said, you got to go outside and be able to be like, that's beautiful too. Um, yeah. that's one of the reasons I was so drawn to bhakti yoga in particular is that as the yoga, really the emotional yoga, it's about, um, recognizing the, the divinity in all states of feeling like all, yeah. all moods, all atmospheres, all states of feeling as expressions of something divine. And I've always, so for me, that was like always been super attracted to that as a very moody Capricorn moon, you know, <laughs> have to have to find room for those things. Otherwise you end up feeling like a bad person or you try to hide parts of yourself. And you know, what's not at the end of the day, there's just uh 
there's nothing like feeling like there's a place on your shelf for for all all of you you know all of you and, and your chart says that you know it's, it's funny as you say that too because my favorite chapter in the gita is um the cosmic vision you know pl you know arjuna please show oh, me yeah. the true form and the language of the description it's like yes there are beautiful scenes but there are terrifying scenes and there are you know keep um, going uh there's so many um there's a totality in that vision really really amazing see if um, i can i don't know if i can angle this over there can you see. see that right there kind of it's a little blurry there it is there's the universal vision right there oh man yes so it's just oh and there's you can't really see it but there's like fire there's like mouths like eating people and stuff it's yeah. pretty crazy there's, there's something yeah it's, oh that's beautiful um had to show the, you that it, no that was, that's, that's, I'm like i'm like i gotta go up and get that right now um there's uh there's a, there's you know the the thousand mm -hmm. eyes with a thousand and a thousand stomachs and like the whole like these really incredibly indestructive images and creative images and I, I've all, I never really realized years ago why I was drawn to that, but it's exactly this, right? That God, the great mind or the luminous mind, you might say in, in the traditions I study, there's a totality in it. It's all present. It's all part of it. How could hallelujah mean anything but that? Right. <laughs> you know, like I've always thought, I've always felt that way. I'm like, what are we going to hallelujah this, but not that? I mean, hallelujah seems to bring it all in, you know? So Exactly. Exactly. And the thing... <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's so true and you know even you know even luke's you know hanging on there you know with his one hand you know like you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh my god dude we have gone from star wars to all devouring universal minds like this is the this has been the best this has really been fun but uh thank you for uh yeah, thank you for sharing that story. It's, that's a, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I get that on a deep level, that on a different way from my own life. Well, you inspired me to share that story because I, it's just, as you were talking, I was like, oh, I, you've got to hear the story. But I want, before we go, we've been going back and forth about a lot of interesting things. Hopefully people have found this, in, this conversation stimulating. Um, give us, I don't know, a couple of rapid fire, uh, luminous pearls of wisdom for people who are studying astrology or thinking of getting more serious about it, thinking of starting a practice, give us a few, few gems that we can leave with. First thing I would say is definitely take a class. You have, it's, it, it, you, you really need the feedback and take one with nightlight astrology, but, no. <laughs> but seriously, no, <laughs> you know, one of the things I really appreciate, and this is not just to, you know, blow smoke up your ass. It's true. <laughs> you, um, put together a real curriculum of a class. And, and you really, I think you need a teacher to reflect things off of, um, to ask questions, to get some solid, it's like music. You, you need to learn how to play your scales and do your arpeggios before you can learn how to play concertos and symphonies. You just have to learn how to do that. So take a class. The other thing I would say is um, get really precise with the moon cycle. That has helped me immensely. Like if you really want to start getting like sort of nitty gritty with astrology, track the moon for two or three months as it goes through the signs and watch where every other planet is and the dignity of that planet. And on a felt level, that has helped me more than anything to get a sense of like, what are the interactions of these energies? Because the moon reflecting that down for me has been immensely helpful just like two or three months of just really tracking where the moon is and where all the other planets are. Um, the other thing I would say is just do it. Start reading for friends. Uh, that's what I did. And um, it actually helps, I think, to start reading for people who um, you know a little bit because you can, you can actually start to see archetypes a little bit easier in that way. Um, and... Uh, don't be afraid to sort of stumble over yourself as you begin, because it actually does loosen up faster than you think. Yeah. Yeah. The stumbling is the loosening, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, it's, I, I've seen in now many, many years of teaching yoga teachers, people who have studied or, or practiced yoga for a long time. And, you know, we get into the first weekend of teacher training. I'm like, come on up and teach two sun salutation A's, which is a fairly repetitive process that happens in many flow yoga classes and they've done those for years but 
all of a sudden they're frozen in the language of bringing it out into expressing it to others. And that's what I always say to them. I'm like, you're, you're, you're trying to express what you've always felt, but you're now trying to marry the words to that. And you just have to do that. You have to repeat it often in order for it to manifest a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's such solid advice. Um, you give readings. I think one of the pieces of advice that I would add is uh, get readings from people. Uh, get a, get some different eyes on your chart other than your own when you're studying. It really helps. Um, it helps to see how people read. It helps to learn something new about your chart. Uh, on that note, I will return Alex's favor of recommending my class and recommend that you check out his website, alexamorosiyoga.com. People can book readings there or they just get in touch with you to book a reading there. Get in touch with me. I'm actually, I should have a new website live in the next couple of months where you'll be able to book. But for now, just contact me from there on the email. And then Instagram is at Alex Amorosi Healing. Um, and you can follow Alex uh, posting videos. You do live streams occasionally. And um, yeah, and there's lots of good content there for people to follow up with. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Achuta. This has been, this has been awesome. Really yeah. awesome. Really fun, fun. I feel like we uh, we ranged across the universe and uh, found that it was also right here. Yeah, we also got to a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you everybody for listening. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, if you uh, want to, you can go back in the archives and check out other episodes of this series, Becoming a Professional Astrologer. There are lots of good conversations in there with lots of other really unique, amazing people. So be sure to check those out. Um, don't forget before we go to like and subscribe, share your comments on this episode, helps, helps the algorithm to direct people to this channel. Really appreciate that. You can always find a transcript of the daily talk on my website, nightlightastrology.com. All right, well, that is it for today. Thanks everyone for listening and thanks Alex for being here. Thanks so much, Judah.